Okay, so yeah, I think we'll uh, make a start. Uh, welcome to our first linguistics departmental seminar of term three. It's nice to see so many familiar faces and a good crowd. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker um, for today, one of our yeah, homegrown uh, speakers. Um, many of you will know Aisha, either through um, yeah, her teaching you um, or colleagues here as well. I know I myself am grateful um, to Aisha for the fact that I'm here, I think. Um, her teaching has played a, a big role in, in my development, I'm sure I speak for others here as well. Um, Aisha has worked on Berber, um, various varieties of Berber, um, did her PhD um, here, um, and has worked on uh, motion, um, mood, tense and aspect in Berber in the past, um, dialectic directionals, association motion um, in Berber and then more broadly in African languages, um, and today is kind of coming back to talk to us about state um, in particular, so uh, the syntax of normal states in Berber. Thank you. Yes, so um, the, uh, the focus of my talk today is uh, an alternation in the uh, morphological marking of nouns that uh, is found in some Berber languages. Uh, Berber languages are languages uh, that belong to the um, Afro-Asiatic film and they're spoken all across North Africa, so uh, from Morocco all the way um, East, I think, um, into Egypt uh, and uh, in the south of North Africa, in Mali, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, um, and uh, Niger. Sorry, Niger is missing from the list. There uh, is no agreed subclassification sub of Berber languages, uh, so it is common to classify these languages by uh, the countries in which they are spoken or the, reg the region sorry, in which they are spoken. Uh, there are some important lexical and phonological variations across the family. The morphosyntax is more constant, but there are some uh, micro variations, of course. So as I said um, um, a few seconds ago, the focus of the talk is the alternations in uh, the morphological marking of nouns. Um, there's an example of what uh, this uh, morphological marking entails in one. So in 1A, my stomach, it hurt me. Uh, you see the, the, the first noun in that sentence, uh, stomach, um, contains a, a vowel, an A vowel, which is glossed as uh, FS. Um, so that's uh, an example of uh, a noun in what we call the free state form. And uh, in 1B, uh, my stomach hurt. Um, so it's the same sentence, but the word order is different. If you look at the noun uh, stomach, again, now you see that the A vowel is missing. Um, and the gloss says uh, CS, and that's for uh, construct state. Um, so the aims today is uh, first to describe the syntax of this uh, alternation. Uh, and I'll do that based on data from um, a few Berber languages. So I'll, I'll look at data from Targbaylit, uh, which is spoken in Algeria. There are a couple of examples from Tuareg, uh, the variety spoken in Niger and Mali, and then some uh, variety spoken in uh, Morocco, Tashilhit, Tarifit, uh, etc. Uh, the second M is to look at a proposal by Koenig uh, that this nominal morphological marking is in fact a case marking uh, which follows a marked uh, nominative pattern. Uh, and the third M is to explore the link between uh, case marking and uh, information structure. So I'll start with uh, a basic description of uh, the syntax of Berber. Uh, I'll start with uh, core clauses. So what I call core clauses are the sort of the, the, the clauses excluding the uh, discourse function position. Um, so in these core clauses, uh, the verbs uh, can well surface in different stems. Uh, there are different stems across Berber languages, but three are uh, found commonly: uh, the imperfective, the perfective, and the aorist stem. Uh, these verb stems, they are obligatorily marked for subject agreement, and subject agreement is marked uh, depending on the person and number uh, by prefixation, suffixation, or uh, both. The unmarked order in these core clauses is uh, VSO, 
all arguments can be omitted if they are recoverable from the context and if they are cross-referenced on, uh, on a verbal head, so it's either the verb or a tense aspect mood particle which precedes the verb. Um, and cross-reference occurs either by uh, subject agreement, so uh, yeah, this uh, with, is either with the subject agreement markers, accusative or dative clitics. Uh, indirect objects, they can also optionally be doubled by uh, dative clitics. And uh, in these uh, core clauses, so post-verbally, uh, arguments can occur in different uh, orders. Uh, there are a few examples, four examples in uh, two which uh, show everything that I've uh, just explained about the, uh, the, the syntax of core clauses. Uh, we can look at uh, a couple of these examples. So, for instance, 2A, God gave me a fiancé. So, uh, that's an example of uh, a VSO order. The verb is first, God is the subject and uh, fiancé is the, um, the object. Um, and the verb uh, carries the uh, subject agreement marker, which is a prefix, and it also carries a, a dative uh, clitic, which uh, occurs after the, the verb stem, and that dative clitic replaces a, a, a sort of nominal um, indirect object. Uh, in uh, 2D, so we can skip 2B and 2C. In 2D, she cut the navel string uh, from the boy. Um, we have an example uh, in which the indirect object is doubled by a dative clitic. So uh, the as uh, just, sorry, the, 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 the S just after the, the verb is a dative clitic. Uh, and it doubles uh, the indirect uh, object uh, to the boy. And as you can see from these four examples, uh, as uh, direct object and indirect objects uh, can occur in um, different orders. Uh, now, uh, alternations to these uh, canonical orders are usually related to information structure. So topic arguments uh, all occur in the preverbal position. Subjects, direct and indirect objects are obligatorily cross-referenced uh, on the verb by uh, respectively subject markers, accusative and dative clitics. Uh, there are two examples in three. The first one is an example where uh, a subject is the topic. My sister-in-law, she touched me here. So my sister-in-law is uh, moved to the preverbal position and uh, it's cross-referenced by uh, the um, agreement prefix on the verb to touch. In 3b, we have an example of a direct object, uh, which is in a uh, topic. This boy, I carried him in my hands. So the boy, again, is uh, moved to the preverbal position, uh, and it's cross-referenced in the uh, core clause by uh, an accusative clitic, so the, the t thing after the verb to take. Focus arguments also occur in the preverbal position. They occur in cleft constructions, so the focused uh, constituent or argument um, is preceded by a copula, uh, the, and its phonological variance depending on the, uh, on the Berber language, and it's followed by uh, what is usually considered to be a complementizer E, I, or add, again, depending on the variety. There's an example in uh, four. It is tears that I was crying. So the noun for tears is uh, in focus. It's uh, fronted, and it occurs between the copula D and the uh, complementizer. In subject cleft, so when subjects are uh, in focus, the uh, verb in the core clause um, in, in most varieties must occur in the participial form and it carries default agreement and default agreement in Berber is marked by the third singular marker. Uh, so there's an example of this in five. It is me who bought two books. Um, the pronoun me is uh, in, in focus here. Uh, and uh, you can see the verb is in the participial form which is marked by the suffix ne 
and uh, the agreement is a third singular masculine. It's the default uh, agreement. Right, so now I'll um, discuss the state alternation, the, the syntax of the state alternation. I'll start with um, a brief uh, description of how uh, the, the state alternation is marked morphologically. And before that, I need to explain a little bit about uh, the morphology of, of, of nouns, uh, mainly how uh, gender and uh, number um, are marked uh, on nouns in the language. So um, masculine is uh, unmarked. The feminine is marked by um, t, uh, which is prefixed and suffixed onto the stem in the singular. Um, so I give two examples in six. Uh, the first noun, Amrar, old man, is uh, tamrart in the feminine. Isli, groom, becomes tislit in the feminine. The plural is marked either by a change of the initial vowel and a suffix, or by a suffixation only. So uh, with some nouns, there is no change in the uh, initial vowel. Um, um, again, there are a couple of examples in seven. So the singular. Uh, noun amra becomes imraden in the plural, so the initial vowel has changed. It's uh, it's gone from an a uh, to an e, and uh, there's a, a suffix an at the end. The second noun adgar uh, widower uh, becomes adgaren in uh, the plural, so uh, the first vowel is actually not um, changed. Um, in addition to these nouns, in uh, most Berber languages, they occur in two forms, um, depending uh, on their syntactic function and position. So the, the first form is the free state form, and it's from the French uh, l'état libre. And the second form is called, uh, in the English literature, the construct state form. Um, I'm, I'm using that, that term here, but uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Arabic and other languages with uh, the construct state. The construct state in Berber is a completely different uh, phenomenon. Uh, but I, I, I use the term because it's the term which is uh, used in the English literature on the uh, state alternation uh, in Berber. So the free state is uh, the unmarked form of uh, the nouns. It's considered to be the unmarked form uh, because it's the citation form of nouns and also because the, the construct state is derived uh, from the th free state through changes in uh, a noun's uh, prefix. Uh, there are variations across Berber languages as to how uh, these prefixes are derived, but to summarize in uh, the masculine, uh, you have either a change of the initial vowel, so usually a becomes u, as in uh, ayazid, free state, uyazid, uh, construct state form, rooster, uh, or the initial vowel is deleted and a glide is inserted. Uh, so argas in the free state form becomes wargas, a uh, man, and irgazen in the free state form becomes a uh, yirgazen, man. So the initial vowel is deleted and uh, year and were is uh, inserted. Uh, for some nouns as well, only a glide is inserted, so there is no change in the initial vowel. And the example I give is as for day. Sorry, I forgot to uh, include the, the gloss. So it's as for day, uh, which becomes was in the construct state. In the feminine, only the initial vowel is uh, deleted to, uh, in the construct state. So tamhart, free state, becomes tamhart, where only the the R is uh, deleted. The free state, because it's the unmarked form of nouns, uh, occurs in uh, a wide range of contexts, and it occurs, obviously, in more contexts than the, uh, the construct state. Uh, uh, so we find it for citation, as I said before. We find it on adjectives, all adjectives, uh, adverbs, and uh, other sort of uh, contexts. I give an example in eight of uh, an adjective uh, used in, in the free state form. 
but uh, uh, today I would like to focus on only the syntactic context where uh, there is a contrast uh, between the free state and um, the construct state. So uh, there is a contrast uh, between the, the two states uh, when we look at preposition and particularly at the complements of prepositions. So uh, in most Berber languages, um, most prepositions have a complement which occurs in the construct, uh, construct state form, so which has to occur in the construct state form. I give a list of uh, prepositions, so you have a ne, the genitive of, uh, se, which is the instrumental, it means with, etc., etc. There are two examples in 9 uh, and 10. Uh, 9, the contraction started at 6 in the evening. Uh, the noun evening is the complement of the, prepo the genitive preposition and it's in the construct state form. 10, she removed the navel string from the boy by cutting it. So literally she cut him the navel string to the boy. Um, the noun boy, uh, she's is in the construct state because it's the complement of the dative preposition uh, e. We also find a construct state, well, nouns in the construct state when they come after, uh, well, what are called prepositions in the literature, but they're not really prepositions. They're, I mean, they, they, they are noun, but they have the, the meaning of prepositions. Uh, and uh, these so-called prepositions are always followed by another preposition, the genitive uh, n. Uh, and uh, the genitive n can be uh, omitted. Uh, depending on various um, reasons. Uh, so in 11, he sits on the carpet. Uh, the noun carpet is in the construct state because it's the complement of that uh, preposition, uh, nominal preposition, uh, on Sufala. Uh, now there are also some uh, prepositions which do not take complement nouns in the construct state, but they take uh, complement nouns in the free state. Uh, so all the prepositions in all varieties of Berber, all the prepositions that are uh, borrowed or from Arabic, like uqbal, uh, before, mbla, without, they always take a complement in the free state. Uh, and there are uh, other uh, prepositions uh, specific to uh, dialects that take the free state. There is one uh, which, to my knowledge, is common to all the Berber languages. It's the preposition meaning until, and that preposition always take a complement in uh, the free state. And I give an example in 12. Uh, I walked until the camp. Um, you can see that the camp is uh, in the free state. Uh, inside NP, we see a relevant-ish contrast between the construct state and the free state. So uh, the head of a noun phrase is always in the free state, unless it's in a, con a syntactic context where, well, it, it needs to get the, free st uh, the construct state. Sorry. So if it's, say, the complement of a preposition which governs the construct state, it will be in the construct state. Uh, but canonically, it, it's in the free state. Uh, and nominal arguments such as possessors and complements uh, must occur in the construct state form. Uh, and uh, in fact, these uh, possessors and complements, they are always, uh, well, in all languages, they are preceded by the genitive pre uh, preposition uh, and of. But that preposition is optional, so in some context, it, it can be omitted. Uh, there are two examples in 13 and 14. The example in 14 shows uh, an example of a possessor, so the man's house or the, the, the house of the man. The man is in the construct state. Uh, 14, we made uh, butter couscous, so butter is the complement of uh, couscous and it's in the construct state. Uh, in the uh, well, as far as the, 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 the subject uh, function is concerned, there is also a relevant uh, contrast between the construct state and the free state. So uh, both intransitive and transitive subjects, uh, so S and A uh, in core clauses, so that's when they follow the verb, occur, must occur in the construct state form. Uh, there are two examples in 15. The first one, 15a, is an example of an uh, S subject. Now it's over. The boy is born. Um, 
the S subject is in its canonical position. It follows the verb, it's in the construct state. 15B, the sister of the groom cooked the meal. The sister is a, a transitive subject. It follows the verb, it's in the construct state. Uh, when S and A precede the verb, uh, they cannot be in the construct state, though they have to be in the free state. So in 16A, it is the sister of the groom who cooked the meal. The sister now precedes the verb. I mean, it's in a, a copula uh, construction, so it precedes the verb and it's in the free state form. Uh, 16B, that song, it was on from the moment we got there. Uh, the song is uh, an S uh, argument. It precedes the verb and uh, it's in the free state. It has to be in the free state. Uh, right dislocated subject, whether transitive or intransitive, so whether S or A, um, have to be in the free state also. And there's an example in 17. The example is from Tarifit Berber, spoken in Morocco. So she soon became pregnant, her daughter-in-law. So the daughter-in-law is an S here, I think. Uh, and it has to be in the free state uh, form. In uh, copula clauses, we have also um, a contrast between the construct state and the free state. So copula clauses uh, in Berber are marked by the copula de, followed by a nominal predicate. That nominal predicate, it, predicate sorry, is always in the free state, uh, no matter what. Uh, there's an example in 18, uh, Damshi, I can't speak Berber. Uh, it is a cat, uh, and, and, and the noun cat is in the free state because it is the, the nominal predicate. Um, an S, so a subject uh, in a copula clause, can be overtly realized, in which case it canonically uh, precedes the, the, the D plus predicate complex, and it has to occur in the free state as well. Uh, so 19, Akshisha, the mich, uh, this child, it is your son. Uh, child uh, is the S argument here. It precedes the uh, predicate and it is in the free state. Direct objects are in the free state regardless of their position in the clause in, um, well, in most Berber languages. So there are two examples in 20. 20A, at the time of the lamb's lettuce harvest, we would go to harvest lamb's lettuce. So at the end of the sentence, there's the noun lamb lettuce. It's the object of the verb harvest. It's in the free state. In 20B, this boy, I carried him in my hands. Uh, here, the direct object is in preverbal position. It's also in uh, the free state. Uh, now I will discuss some uh, micro variations. So most of these uh, micro variations, they concern uh, Takbaylit, which is spoken in Algeria. Um, so I'll talk about uh, a variation in uh, copula clauses. So as I have just said, uh, in copula clauses, an S, so an intransitive subject, can be uh, overtly realized and in most Berber languages, it, it precedes the, uh, the, the predicate. But in some varieties, uh, such, at, uh, such as, sorry, Tarbaylit, Tamazirt, and Tarifit, the S can follow uh, the predicate. Uh, in some of these languages, the non-initial S uh, can be in the construct state. That's what we find in uh, Targbailit and Tarifit. Uh, there are two examples in 21. 21A is from Targbailit. So that girl is or was mute. Uh, the subject, that girl, follows the, um, the copula and the predicate. It's in the construct state. Uh, 21B is from Tarifit. She is an ogress, this one. The pronoun, uh, this one is uh, the subject and it's in the construct state. And in other varieties, the non-initial subject is always in the free state. Um, so uh, in 22, there are two examples from Tamazirt. Uh, 
Uh, this mule is on Ruli. The noun mule precedes the predicate. It's in the free state. 22b is the same thing. This mule is on Ruli, except that the noun follows the predicate there, and it's also in uh, the free state. Uh, many varieties of Berber have uh, what are called pseudo-verbal constructions. So they are constructions which involve a predicate which has some properties of verbs and uh, which doesn't have other properties of verbs. Um, so these predicates, they usually take some form of uh, agreement, uh, like verbs, but they cannot be inflected for aspect, unlike verbs. And the agreement marker which occurs on these uh, pseudo verb is often an accusative uh, clitic. Um, in this construction, um, the S argument uh, is always in the free state, but in Tagbailit, there are constructions in which the S argument uh, can be either in the construct state or the free state, and again, it depends on its position. So if uh, the S argument follows the pseudo verb, it's in the construct state, as in 23, uh, so that man is bad, uh, the subject is in the construct state. Uh, and if the subject precedes the uh, predicate, it's in the free state. So 24, this grape is not good for eating. Um, the grape is in the free state because it, it precedes the verb. And uh, finally, there are uh, varieties of Targbalit and some varieties of Tamazirt where a direct object can also be in the construct state. Uh, it can be in the construct state if um, it follows the verb and uh, it is cross-referenced by an accusative clitic on the verb, so a so-called accusative clitic doubling. Uh, we can see this in 25, so 25a, he ate the meat. The direct object uh, meat is in the free state, uh, that's the, the, the expected marking. In 25b, he ate that meat, however, the noun meat is in the construct state, it's in the construct state because it follows the verb and it's uh, doubled by the, the clitic t which occurs on the verb. The uh, direct object, which is doubled by a clitic and in the construct state form, may occur inside the core clause. That's what we have in 25b, or it can occur after a, um, a prosodic boundary. So it, it would be outside of the core clause. That's what we have in uh, 26. Uh, she found it was the mountain cat who inhabited the house, um, who inhabited it, the house. So the noun, uh, the the direct object, sorry, house uh, is uh, in the construct state because it's doubled by um, an accusative clitic, but it occurs um, after um, the closed boundary. So uh, in 27, um, I have a, a little table summarizing um, the, the context in which we find uh, the construct state and the context in which we find the, the free state. Um, I, I won't go through that again. Um, but I think basically what the table shows is that there are just two main uh, contexts where we find the construct state is when uh, the noun is a dependent of a preposition or when the noun is a dependent uh, of a verb. Um, so this is uh, basically what, uh, what we have with case marking. So uh, case marks uh, nouns which are dependents on uh, different heads, uh, usually a verb and um, a preposition. Um, so the state alternation in Berber looks like uh, a, a case alternation or some kind of case marking. However, uh, there are not a lot of uh, case analysis um, of the state alternation amongst uh, the Berber literature. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip some detail about the, the literature a little bit, okay? So, 
the, the majority of uh, analyses on the, uh, the state alternation, um, they focus on word order and the sort of uh, syntactic or structural configuration in which the noun occurs. So uh, for them, uh, the construct state, uh, a noun is marked for construct state if it uh, occurs next to uh, a particular head. Um, and there are other kinds of analyses which um, um, analyze the construct state as marking some uh, particular functional relations between the noun and a uh, preceding um, head. Uh, there is a, a proposal not in uh, the Berber literature made by uh, Koenig and Eichenwald and uh, they propose that uh, the case, uh, the state alternation sorry, in Berber is actually a case alternation and that uh, Berber languages have uh, what they call a marked uh, nominative case pattern. Um, and that's what I, I would like to discuss next, because I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it, it works for Berber. It's a good analysis of, of the state alternation. So um, according to their um, argument or analysis, uh, Berber languages follow uh, a marked nominative case system. So marked nominative languages are typologically very rare. They occur mostly in Africa and uh, they are case systems that share characteristics of both uh, nominative uh, systems and uh, ergative systems. So uh, like nominative systems, uh, they treat intransitive subject S and transitive subjects uh, A in the same way and they contrast them with uh, direct objects, so O. And like ergative system, the form of the uh, transitive uh, subject is the one which is uh, marked. Uh, and I give two examples in 29 of a, a language um, with a nominative, uh, with marked uh, nominative. The language is uh, Tenet, it's a Nilo-Saharan language. So in 29A, sorry, squirrel went there, uh, we have uh, an S, which is uh, marked with the nominative marker E. Uh, 29B, lower speared Yoma. We have a transitive subject, lower, which is marked with uh, a case E. Uh, and um, an object, Yoma, which is uh, unmarked. So Koenig, uh, 2008, reviews in detail seven languages which uh, she argues uh, follow a marked nominative case system. Uh, most of these languages, uh, in most of these languages, sorry, the nominative and the accusative are part of uh, more complex uh, case paradigms. So it, 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 it's on the, 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 the markers that they analyzed as marked nominative and accusative are uh, uncontroversially uh, case not like in Berber. Um, and uh, so in uh, 30, I don't have the time to go through the, the, the entire description of Mark nominative. So in uh, 30, I have uh, summarized uh, the context in which uh, we find both the, the accusative and the nominative in Mark nominative languages. And I contrast them or compare them to the context in which uh, we find the th free state and the construct state in uh, Berber languages. So the idea uh, according to um, this mark nominative analysis is that the accusative uh, corresponds to the free state or the free state is uh, an, a marker of accusative and the construct state is a marker of uh, nominative. Uh, and as you can see from the table in uh, most uh, context, I mean the, 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 the accusative, the free state behaves exactly like the accusative and the construct state behaves exactly like the uh, nominative. Uh, and there are some contexts which are uh, particularly uh, interesting, I think. So um, the S and A in post-verbal position um, are never marked with the uh, accusative in marked nominative languages. They are never marked with the free state in Berber languages. They are always marked with the nominative in marked nominative languages and they are always marked with the construct state in Berber languages. Uh, the S and A, when they are in pre-verbal position, on the other hand, 
are always marked with the accusative in marked nominative languages, and in Berber they are always marked uh, by the free state and the direct object uh, are marked, uh, well, are unmarked in the accusative in marked nominative languages and in the free state uh, always in Berber languages. So um, this proposal is uh, actually not uh, liked by uh, Berber <coughs> scholars um, and I think it's because uh, there are some uh, arguments, well, there are some issues that are not addressed, and these issues are usually the main arguments that people in the Berber literature give uh, to analyze the states as states rather than um, case markers. One of uh, these arguments is the uh, word order and precedence. So um, the construct state is only found uh, when it follows the head that it depends on. Um, another thing is the mismatch between the state and the, the state marking, sorry, and the grammatical functions of S and A. Um, so um, the argument against Koenig analysis is that if the construct state is a nominative case, then uh, intransitive and transitive subjects should always be in the construct state, uh, regardless of their position. Uh, and the third uh, argument is the mismatch between the construct state and the grammatical functions of object and clitic doubling in, in some varieties. And um, uh, what um, Berber scholars usually say is that uh, if the construct state is a nominative, a nominative case, sorry, it should not mark uh, direct objects. And um, they also focus on the fact that the uh, construct state on the object uh, is, uh, goes with uh, clitic doubling. Okay? So for them, the uh, clitic doubling is the thing which triggers the construct state. Um, right. So in the last few minutes of the talk, I would like to... Uh, provide some kind of explanation. Well, I, I want to keep uh, Koenig's proposal and I'd like to propose some kind of explanation for uh, the differences in um, the case marking or the, the state uh, marking. So uh, my hypothesis is that the construct state and the free state are uh, case markers. So the state alternation is a case alternation. Uh, the construct state is uh, the nominative, the mark nominative, and the free state is the accusative, which is the unmarked case, as proposed by Koenig. Um, and the discourse functions that are associated with uh, S and A, or the, the, the discourse functions with which S and A are associated in Berber, uh, and the O in Tagbailit trigger uh, these uh, changes in case or in state. So I first uh, look at the word order or precedence argument. So the argument which says that um, the, the, the construct state, well, the construct state has to occur because it follows um, a head. Uh, well, in fact, in Berber, when we have uh, changes in word order outside of the core clause, these uh, word order changes, they are related to information structure all the time. Uh, and they occur to mark the discourse functions of topic and focus. And uh, these two functions of topic and focus are, well, highly associated with the preverbal positions. Um, even in copular clauses, the initial uh, position for an intransitive subject for NS is, uh, has been shown to be a topic um, position. Where am I? Uh, so in fact, when a noun is marked for topic or focus, it has to precede the verb. And if a noun precedes the verb, then it, it's, it's either a topic or um, a focus. So we can rest restate the, the precedence as uh, in terms of information structure, sorry, as in 31. So uh, nouns. Uh, that are in discourse function related positions uh, are in the unmarked case, which is the uh, free state, uh, aka the accusative. Um, uh, so it's not 
a noun is not in, in the free state because it doesn't precede a head. It's in the free state because it's in um, a, a discourse function related position. Um, 31 is actually supported by the fact that uh, both transitive and intransitive subjects, so both S and A, um, are in the free state form when they are right uh, dislocated. And um, we saw an example of that in uh, 17. But I, I won't go back to it. I'll be nice. Um, the second um, argument um, or the, the second argument against uh, Koenig's um, proposal, uh, mismatches between states and grammatical functions of S and A. Um, well, the, the transitive and intransitive subjects are always marked, so they are always in the construct state when they occur in their canonical position, so when uh, they occur after the verb, but that's because it's their canonical position. And the only context where we don't find a construct state on an S or an A uh, is when the S and A is in preverbal position, when it is marked for either topic uh, and focus. Um, so we could say something like 32. Uh, S and A, uh, intransitive and transitive subjects, are marked with the nominative case, aka the construct state, uh, but they are unmarked uh, when they are topic and um, focus. So when yeah, they are in, in discourse um, function related positions. Now the last uh, thing uh, I would like to discuss is the nominative or the construct state uh, that we find on direct objects uh, in uh, clitic uh, doubling context. I think, but I, okay, so, so, so this is a hypothesis and I don't have clitic doubling in the variety that I work on, so I don't have the data, so I based myself on the data that I found uh, in the literature. Um, I think the, uh, the objects marked by a uh, construct state in clitic dub doubling context can also be related to information structure. Um, first, the O in this construction, so the object in those constructions must be uh, definite. Uh, but when uh, it's not doubled and not in the construct state, uh, it doesn't have to be definite. So it can be either interpreted as definite or indefinite. So Berber languages don't have a definite or indefinite uh, determiners. It's just, um, it depends on the, on the context, whether a noun is interpreted as indefinite or definite. Uh, in 33, uh, he ate a sweet or the sweet the uh, direct object is not doubled by a clitic. Um, in 33b, on the other hand, the direct object suite is doubled by a clitic, and only the definite interpretation is available. So um, 33b can only meet he at the suite, not he at uh, a suite. Um, secondly, uh, a direct object in when it is in the construct state and doubled by an accusative clitic must have uh, a referent which is uh, identifiable. Uh, and this restriction does not apply with uh, regular direct objects. So 34a, uh, he at I don't know what, uh, we have, well, it's not really an object, well, well it's not an object. It's doubled anyway. Uh, we have something which is not an object, <laughs> which is a, a complement clause, I think. Um, and uh, well, it, it can be the complement of the verb uh, to eat in 34a. It cannot be the complement of the verb to eat in 34b because the verb is doubled by the, well, the complement clause is doubled by an accusative clitic. Although, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that example anymore. Mm -mm, it's a bad example, sorry. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, so the, the, the fact that the object uh, has to be definite or identifiable uh, does not show alone that the object is topical, but um, 
I mean, usually if something is topical, then it has to be definite uh, or, well, often, often it will be definite and identifiable. Uh, but there are other uh, facts supporting the hypothesis that a, clitic with, um, a, a direct object, sorry, which is in the construct state form and doubled by a clitic is topical. Uh, first, in all Berber languages, and we've seen some examples at the beginning of the talk, um, direct objects which are in topic position, they must be cross-referenced or doubled by accusative clitics in the core clause. So um, there is a link uh, between uh, clitic cross-referencing or clitic doubling and uh, topicality uh, in Berber. Second, um, while accusative clitic doubling uh, is rare, it only occurs in uh, Takbailit and some varieties of Tamazir, there's another clitic doubling that uh, occurs across most Berber languages. It's dative clitic doubling. There's an example of that in 35. Now, dative clitic doubling in Berber has been shown to be linked to information structure. It's been shown by Kosman and uh, Suag. Um, and finally, in Takbailit, when we have a right dislocated object, which is obligatorily doubled by an accusative clitic, it's uh, a, t a topic. So that, yeah, it's, it's a topic. It's, it's, um, it's a topic which is reactivated. Um, so um, we can explain the uh, link between the construct state and um, the clitic doubling uh, and link it to information structure, and this is summarized in 36. So O in Berber is unmarked. In Takbailit, O can be simultaneously doubled by a clitic and marked for nominative case if it is topical and uh, follows the verb. Now, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a lot of data, and this is only a hypothesis. Um, and uh, nobody really has explained the, uh, the state alternation or the case alternation in Berber in terms of information structure. But some people have linked the marking of nouns to information structure. So um, uh, like Fiwi 2014, uh, she focuses on topic constructions and she considers that the free state participates in uh, determining a topic. Uh, and Metushi and Flesh, um, they also link the difference in case and state marking to discourse functions, but they do that from a syntactic point of view. So their hypothesis is that at some stage, topic and focus arguments were outside um, of the clause, and so they could not receive a canonical or normal um, case marking. I, at this stage, cannot explain why uh, the information structure would affect the case marking of S, A, and O um, in such a way, and uh, why a topical O would have to be marked simultaneously by the construct state and uh, clitic doubling. Um, however, the alternations in the case of subjects and direct objects depending on either semantic or pragmatic factors uh, do exist um, in other languages and they are reported in the literature. Uh, for instance, Derimpol and Nikoleva, uh, they describe a similar-ish phenomenon for direct objects in two Semitic languages. Uh, and in these two Semitic languages, a direct object is uh, normally unmarked, uh, but it can be marked for case when it is topical. Uh, Derimpol and Nikoleva also show that uh, optional object agreement can be linked to topicality. So assuming that clitic doubling uh, is a kind of uh, agreement, um, then we can say that topical objects in Takbailit have to be marked or can be marked optionally by both um, agreement and case. Um, so the, uh, the conclusion. The syntactic distribution of the nominal state alternation in Berber is uh, similar to the distribution of nominative and accusative cases in marked nominative languages as uh, suggested by Koning. 
At the closal level, the state alternation marks the grammatical functions S, A, and O. The unmarked form, the free state or the accusative, marks O arguments always in the uh, canonical clause, except in tag valid. The marked form uh, marks subject and uh, uh, transitive and intransitive subjects. It seems that the discourse functions of these grammatical functions trigger changes in the canonical case marking or the canonical state marking. Uh, S and A are unmarked if they are in topic or focus positions. And uh, in tag violet, a direct object can be optionally marked if uh, topical. Now, there are two domains that I haven't looked at today. But I wouldn't have had the time anyway. Uh, the noun phrase and uh, the prepositional phrase. Um, I, do, do the, I, I, I don't know what happens. I think, I mean, the, I don't know what happens in the noun phrase um, and the prepositional phrase uh, might be a bit more, um, might be different. I think I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we have time for questions, comments. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Aisha. I very much enjoyed, enjoyed that. Very stimulating. Um, <clears throat> do, do you have any um, thoughts um, about, like, about the diachrony of, of this? Because um, Maybe I just kind of dreamt this, but I have this vague notion that people, some people have tried to suggest that at least some of the, um, the free state morphemes um, might be derived from demonstratives or? Uh, from def, yeah, defini or all definite articles. All definite articles. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on, no. I, 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 th it's just because, if that's true, um, it does seem to kind of, to my mind, explain quite a lot because, you know, because you expect subjects to be definite and you don't expect objects to be definite and, you know, cross-linguistically com you, you commonly get this phenomenon of differential object marking. If, if an object out of character is definite, then you have to mm. do some extra signaling of it then also possessors tend to be definite. So um, I'm not, um, you know, I like your analysis and I'm not in any way disputing it, but um, I guess I'm saying I always like to look at things diachronically and it, and, and it, would, make, it would make sense to me if it, if it had, if what, what is now the, uh, I can never remember which one it is. The, the construct state. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, was, the free was, state. The free state was, was originally um, some kind of definiteness marking because, um, uh, <coughs> you know, that could, ex that could explain a lot of the, or a lot of the distribution, a lot of the um, distribution we now see would be consistent with what you would expect when it was a definiteness marker in the yeah. past. But okay, maybe I didn't understand well. The, 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 the definite, so if the definite would explain why a, a subject is marked? Yeah, I mean, it's the kind of logic would have been flipped. But originally, um, you know, what would have happened is that, um, you know, subjects tend to be kind of old news, right? Yeah. And therefore definite. So it just, it just w would have happened that very often subjects would have been marked with this definiteness yeah. mark. Yeah. And then as it lost its kind of special definiteness meaning, then, then the kind of motivation flips and it, and it becomes a kind of signal of subjecthood. Yeah. Something. Yeah, but I need to check because I think it's the it's the free state vowel uh, which people argue derives from a definite marker. Yeah. I think uh, it's the a, uh, the a, uh, and the a uh is, is is I mean the free state is is not the canonical 
subject marker. But 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 the were yeah yeah but but yeah you still have a, a good point because the the were as well I think it's uh, yeah I mean I might have <laughs> somehow I no 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 I it's not a dream because I know I I yeah yeah no I've seen it so it's, no you haven't dreamed it. <coughs> Along the same lines, and I also wanted to thank you, my head is full of <laughs> really fascinating data. I'm not sure I got all of it into my non verbal head. Um, so, what, going back to, um, were, to point one on page eight, where you systematize um, what a mark nominative case system looks like, and then it combines yeah. properties of both. Um, nominative and ergative uh, yeah. systems. That is really interesting because it immediately reminded me of John Dubois' preferred argument structure, um, which is now a bit dated, so I don't think many people no, I'm not know familiar of with it. that. So that is, um, he's written several, one language paper and several other papers on the discourse basis of, on the ergative basis of discourse, which means that even in nominative accusative languages, you get uh, a distribution of full NPs with this pronominal NPs that reflects ergative systems. So that you have S and P as full NPs and A pronominal. And that is, of course, related to um, information structure as well. So in discourse, you wouldn't get um, the man hit the boy. You would have something like the man came, he hit the boy. Yeah, so this is about the, the distribution of oh, yeah, okay. NPs versus phenomenal NPs. And so it, it looks a little bit like um, the other languages conflate that. So nominative accusative languages differentiate. They have one in their case system and one in their information structure. And it looks a little bit like verbal languages might conflate this okay. um, by paying attention to information uh, structure criteria and grammaticalizing them. Okay. System. Okay. And, you know, very precise. Okay. And that's Dubois. Dubois. Okay. What's the first name? John. John. UCSD. Thank you. Other questions going yet, sir? Um, I was just wondering, when you have this mark object, so in um, sorry, 25 feet, it's quite confusing the way the way that the alignment works. So I was wondering if the object is marked and the subject always will also be marked in the same way. Am I saying it the wrong way around? Ah uh, yes, if you have a, a subject and an object, yes, yes, yes. Yes. So the subject will be would be in the construct state and the direct object in the construct state. Yeah. Yeah. It's really not marking mathematical relations. But the, uh, it, That's it, what you're it, saying. That's what you're saying. No, I'm saying it's marking gram grammatical functions. Okay. E except, yeah, except in this context. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We agree. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, out of curiosity, so why are the uh, researchers working on Berber so reluctant to take up <laughs> the case analysis? Um, is it just the case of you know an established regional school and it's no, no. which can be very common for Semitic languages or? The, but first of all, yeah. there's the word order thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's. Also, there's some sort of influential scholars on Berber, Basse, mm -hmm. uh, Galan, mm -hmm. uh, Shaker, and they don't want a case. I mean, they don't want to analyze that as a mm -hmm. case. They want to analyze that as a, a, a st structural dependency. Okay. Yeah. Plus the, the the prepositions as well. So these 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 prepositions that take the construct state, not the nominal prepositions, the other prepositions, in in many languages, particularly in Takbayli, they tend to 
attach or combine uh, with the noun, so they form like they, they, they form just one word. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a few analyses showing that, uh, and uh, and also the, the the construct state is formed by deleting a vowel or reducing a vowel. So the argument is it's. It reduces phonologically, so it's phonologically deficient, hence syntactically deficient, hence it needs to be close to something else. Mm. It's a combination of things. Forgive me for being ignorant as to your work, but where are your data from and what's your... Uh, so the Tagbali data, which uh, is not reference, is mine. Uh, I collected it when I did my field work uh, a few years ago. Uh, and the rest of the data, so all the data which is references from the literature, so either grammars, descriptions of um, information structures. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of a follow-on from Chris's question, but in the other direction. So I know some people working on uh, the state and various varieties of Berber have discussed it being eroded, the, the state alternation being lost, yeah. um, perhaps through context, uh, uh, murmurs. Um, and I was wondering if in that context you have anything to say about which of the alternations are lost, if we know? The construct know. state. So everything then collapses to the free state, the on mark. And one, yeah. if there are particular contexts in which that happens more than others, or whether it seems to be like random, uh, so some that are more robust than others. But I don't, mm, I don't know a lot. I know that um, there are traces. So all the Libyan varieties, uh, Egyptian varieties, have lost it. There are traces in the prepositional phrases. So some prepositions still give the construct state to their complements. Uh, and there's also, yeah, also in the south of Algeria, Zab has lost the alternation. But yeah, in the prepositional phrases, you can find some, some traces. Yeah, so the traces are, as far as I know, they're always in the, in the prepositional phrases. But I haven't really looked uh, so for it yet. Mm. Other questions? Yeah, for Yeah, I mean, Mark, nominative systems are crossing this to be very rare. Very. And what I find striking is the aerial distribution, because they are attested in all verbal languages, and then in East Africa, in a number of languages of different genetic relations, not in Arabic, interesting. So you wonder. I don't what, know. I mean, it's so. It's what it, props up such a system? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I don't yeah. want the the Nilo-Saharan language. I mean, Berber languages have many similarities with Nilo-Saharan languages. Uh, mm -hmm. but with the Nilotic languages, mm -hmm. often there are many, many similarities. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what it means. I'm not. <laughs> I'm going there. <laughs> just, um, you said the argument, one of the arguments against the case analysis was that they, the Berberists usually say the contract state is deficient. Yeah. But it, if you look at the, the phonological processes that are involved in, in the morphological processes, it's always like an augmentation or like building upon the free state. It doesn't ever seem, from what I've seen in the literature and the phonology at least, that the construct state is like diminished. But the, the, okay, a lot of the analysis there in the government phonology framework, <laughs> CV, CV, CV. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, so if the argument is that the vowel in the free state, so the mm -hmm. R thing, mm -hmm. is long, Mm. And so it links to uh, two yeah, yeah. Yeah. CV, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one CV, CV, mm. <laughs> two, well, CV, CV. Mm. And uh, the construct state vowel, they CV disappear. Mm. Uh, so we lose one CV. Yeah. So 
So, that's so it's argument. deficient. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, to me, well, that smells a bit funny. I well, don't know. I, I was convinced. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I, I read I them and skimmed them, but uh, I don't know. It's funny to have them have a phonological argument for uh, like syntactic and morphological. But because in the prepositional domain, it, it, it kind of works. Okay. Yeah. For prepositions, it, it kind of works. Not anywhere else. Though. Are there no other uh, questions or comments? I think we can uh, thank Aisha again for her. Thank you.